one of the things I wanted to mention was the idea that Telegram is supplementary to an investigation is really outdated. Telegram's becoming essential. And by leaving out Telegram in an OSINT investigation, you're just generating a massive blind spot. Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Life for App Security Conversation Series. I'm your host, Robert Value. And today I'm joined by one of our resident OSINT analysts, Spencer Oliphant. In our conversation today, we're going to discuss one of the largest and fastest growing social networks that you've probably never heard of, Telegram. We'll also explore the type of bad actors that use this platform and how security teams can mine the site for useful intelligence. But first, a little bit about Spencer. Like I said, he's one of our resident OSINT analysts here at LifeRap. His day-to-day work involves advising companies on how to monitor the web to identify threats against their operations. And internally here, he's one of our go-to resources for keeping up on the world of alternative social networks. Spencer, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. So we were chatting about this uh, ahead of time. I asked you, you know, what kind of topics were you interested in talking about if you wanted to come back on the show? And the first thing that you brought up was Telegram. So I wanted to ask, what's special about this topic? Well, yeah, when you asked me what I might want to talk about, the first thing I did think of was, uh, had anyone discussed Telegram yet? Because it's really quite emerging quite quickly among fringe groups and protest groups, and particularly those right-wing groups with anti-vax sentiment. So today, Telegram is kind of becoming a really consistent source for illegal activities and things like dark web marketplace links. Oh, maybe just like we can we can back up a bit. So why not why not explain... What exactly is Telegram to our listeners? Totally. So Telegram is a cloud-based instant message app. Kind of think of it like um, WhatsApp. But what makes it unique is it boasts a strong end-to-end encryption, meaning a higher level of information. Simply put, those in the chat are the only ones with access to the chat. However, there is some discussion over how legitimate the security is with Telegram. And that end-to-end encryption is only available in a private chat function. So group chats don't have that function. Initially released in 2013 by the same folks who made VK, which if you're familiar with VK, you know that they are on the lighter side for moderation for illicit activity. What do you mean exactly by lighter content moderation, like say in comparison to say Facebook or Twitter? Yeah, so the moderation of radical, hateful, illegal content, deleting that content, persecuting those users isn't really something that Telegram practices on those larger sites that you mentioned, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. They have greater moderation systems and very laid out guidelines in place for what's permitted. Telegram does not exactly do the same. They're more concerned about getting in trouble from the feds. They delete super illicit activity. But other than that, they kind of have a more hands-off approach. Yeah, I was kind of surprised my first time going on on the Telegram app and kind of seeing the things that I could kind of discover, like very, very out there type of content compared to what your kind of more plain vanilla stuff that you see on, on the mainstream sites. Yeah, it's surprising. They don't try to hide it at all. I think that there's a sense of anonymity and maybe a false sense of security on the Telegram app. And uh, users are definitely feeling much more at liberty to share pretty illicit information or even private information. Now, how many users exactly ballpark are we talking about? Because every time there's like a Facebook outage or an Instagram outage, I I see the headlines, there's a sudden spike in signups, but uh, or a controversy Mm -hmm. over there. So so what are what are we talking about in terms of a user That's base. a great question. Since 2017, 2017, Telegram saw just over 180 million users, which is a lot. But if that sounds like a lot, by 2020, that 180 was now 400 million users. So projecting to tell that Telegram will continue to gain more and more users. It's also an inevitability that a lot of these users are bot accounts and people creating more of replicated accounts to make things like sales or to throw off investigators, that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, I, I saw an interesting infographic the other day where it was like Telegram's now like the seventh or eighth, I, I forget the exact number where it is, but it's beating out a lot of the more mainstream sites that probably your typical security team might be aware of, which despite the fact that Telegram doesn't get nearly as much coverage in terms of a lot of mainstream attention. Yeah, you don't hear about Telegram that much in the news. I think that we're starting to, and we're going to start to see it a lot more, though. Yeah. So why don't we drill then down a little bit and ask 
What kind of activities do you see when you're monitoring this website? What kind of threats should a corporate security analyst be on the lookout for on Telegram? Well, Telegram is an interesting way to communicate with people that share your interests. It's the same purpose a lot of these social media channels serve. But moreover, it's becoming an essential part of understanding that threat landscape and people that are interested in those kind of more illicit conversations or selling illegal tender. So the kinds of threats to well, threats to individual safety are nothing rare on the internet, right? People feel like they're kind of in their own world and they're going to say things that maybe they don't necessarily mean. It's not uncommon to see a threat on the internet. But what makes Telegram threats slightly more concerning is the active nature of the Telegram chat. Some of these chats have thousands of members all posting at the same time to the same feed. And that feed becomes very lively and stimulating to engage in. And so when a new message suggests violence or disruption, there's a higher chance that someone might engage with that person and continue to plot. So that's something that I've noticed in Telegram investigations versus the classic posting into the void where only my followers, if so choosing, will engage with me. The nature of Telegram creates these little echo chambers for people to kind of feed their own fires with each other. I could definitely see that being relevant for someone in EP, executive protection. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to mention was the idea that Telegram is supplementary to an investigation is really outdated. Telegram's becoming essential and I leaving out Telegram in an OSINT investigation, you're just generating a massive blind spot. Right. Other things that, you know, we've seen a recent story on like the, the Financial Times, just talking about like data leaks, this also becoming kind of the popular place to dump a lot of information and just a lot of like counterfeit kind of things. So a lot of different kind of activities. Can you elaborate on some of those? The different activities on the Telegram chat? Yeah. So Telegram is not necessarily illicit, like I was saying, people use Telegram to communicate if they're in a country that has very strict communication policies. Places in Asia don't allow you to be messaging negative things about your government to people outside your country. Telegram allows them to share dark web links or communication and media that otherwise, you know, that may be to their family that otherwise may not be, they may not be able to do so. So it's not all bad. And I think that when you get into a site like Telegram, it can kind of be overwhelming the amount of negativity and the things that go on there. But it's important to remember that it's just a tool and it's just being used in different ways. And it's not necessarily good or evil in its nature. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. Other than that, yes, with that function of having that kind of encryption, it will attract people that are trying to hide from the law. So everything under the sun in that nature does probably exist on Telegram. Telegram also acts as an effective route to the surface from the dark web. So Telegram is a great place for these people to share dark web links to marketplaces, to media, and to just other websites for recruitment purposes or selling purposes. Glad you mentioned that part about the, the good side of this. There's a lot of just normal activities and normal people on these platforms. It's it's just anytime you have an unmoderated section of the web, it seems like you're going to get all the, the the nastiest folks that come out. And I got criticized that in, in one of my own essays for on the subject was, I want to talk about the risks and the bad things that are going on. But then it, you kind of end up painting an image of these platforms sometimes as, as just being cesspools, which, you know, there's... there's yeah, no it's not bad. always accurate. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges analysts kind of run into when they start trying to monitor a site like Telegram? Well, Telegram is kind of hard to search and it has many private chats and it's not a very intuitive site. Uh, it seems as though the devs are kind of aware that of the nature of the content in Telegram. And so they've kept it somewhat unaccessible. Sometimes using Google or other search tools is more effective in finding Telegram channels or people than it would be to search the Telegram app itself. And luckily here at Navigator, we have a great powerful tool that searches Telegram channel names. So that saves me and the other analysts tons of time. And that really helps us leverage Telegram for everything we can. People without that kind of tool, Google's your friend. But um, it's definitely a challenge. I, the only way to really get to know Telegram is to spend time in it. So in terms of, because like you said, some of this stuff is sometimes difficult to navigate with new platforms. If I was a, a security analyst and I want to start incorporating this into my intelligence program, where would you recommend that I get started as a, as a first step? Oh, that's a great question. Step one would be to identify your user base. 
So there's a group of people or there's something, a potential activity that a group of people might do that you're monitoring for, you're interested in. Step one is to identify those people. And what I try to do is to think like those people, you know, what are they looking for? What is the media content that they're looking for? You can try to think like your subject until you come across a community or a channel that you were kind of hoping existed and work backwards from there. So one of the great investigative techniques of Telegram is to rabbit hole through a channel. So channels on Telegram share content back and forth through each other by scrolling backwards up through a channel and in turn following and adding every shared channel, you'll begin to build a spider web network of all of the intersecting channels and communities, which users are likely also following each in between each of them. That's a strong way to build out a database to work from in an investigation without feeling so overwhelmed and just searching into the void. Once you feel like you've really fleshed out that circle, then you can start digging in and monitoring for escalation and protests and you don't have to feel like you're missing a part of the conversation. So what kind of things have you found? I mean, I, I know we got, we got all these NDAs and, and we can't be, be too explicit about this stuff, but what kind of interesting threats have you found through the course of your investigation? popular topic on Telegram is vaccine mandates. The um, was in the news and I was just doing some research yesterday for it. The rate of false vaccine passports for sale, disruptive threats at places like Pfizer, and just figuring out a way to not only monitor, but effectively understand who has power in these conversations and where they're going. That's the other thing to really keep in mind is, you know, these aren't new people or new conversations. They're just here now and that's new and that might change. The only constant with this whole landscape is change. And now that we've seen that increase in moderation from our more conventional social media channels, we're seeing increase in unmoderated activity on those unmoderated channels. And that's just to be expected. And it's just a matter of keeping tabs on it and watching it and understanding it and seeing where it goes next. You kind of hinted on that. And we talked about this a little bit in our previous conversation is just the rapid growth of these unmoderated channels like like Telegram versus say something, you know, more moderated like like Facebook or or Reddit or something like that. So is that something that Telegram plays into as well? With its lack of moderation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Telegram knows where it sits in the market and where its value is for its users. And it would lose that value if it increased moderation. Yeah. It, right. So right now, Telegram has that spotlight for that unmoderated channel, but that could change, right? There's a lot of unmoderated channels out there. This just seems to be where people have congregated to for now. And um, yeah, a lot of these people, they're not solely existing on Telegram, right? These are individuals that have all, they have conventional social media channels too. And the way that you recruit into a Telegram channel is from that surface web. So they are sharing this information on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit. It's just less abrasive, less intense, and it serves the purpose of bringing people into that conversation on Telegram. That's an interesting point you made there. I clued into right away with the recruitment from the surface web. Some of the more controversial content creators that I might see on, on YouTube or, or Twitter and stuff like that, I'll see, oh, they got the, the Telegram channel for different kind of conversations. So that kind of brings you down the, the rabbit hole in the places where there might be a little less supervision from the big tech oligarchs in Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, precisely. They... Even if they're exist, these conversations are existing on somewhere that's kind of hidden, they're a movement. They have something to say. They want to be heard and they want to grow their, they want to expand their reach. And they just can't do that from solely within the Telegram channel. So if there is a Telegram channel that's trying, has an agenda or a cause and is trying to get people in that cause, they don't only exist in the Telegram channel, despite what it may seem. What is a common mistake that you think a rookie or, or someone who's on Telegram for the first time, what is a common mistake that you see in a lot of these OSINT investigations? Well, it's hard to speak for other security teams, but the main mistake is or, just... Or maybe a mistake that you've made in, in yeah. how to navigate. Yeah, this. I'd say personally, I've made mis a mistake in neglecting Telegram, kind of brushing it off as a silly chat room and following, going back later to find out that I could have saved myself hours in an investigation had I rabbit-holed a little bit more in this Telegram channel or just given 
a little bit more credit to some plain text posts in a Telegram channel that were, you know, giving the exact dates and locations to, you know, a sit-in or a disruption at a certain organization. And um, I'm expecting that to be posted somewhere a little bit more public with that idea of recruitment. And you'll find it on Telegram almost 100% of the time if you can't find it somewhere else. If it exists somewhere, somewhere else. And like you said, it's one of those influencers that backs themselves with alternative social channels like Telegram. You can bet some money that they have very open vocal conversations about their intentions on Telegram. And that can be so much more valuable than the assumptions that you'll be making with just an open source traditional media investigation. I think some of it is people are censoring themselves so much on a lot of these mainstream sites trying to get around the censors. Whereas if if you don't have to do that, you get a much better sense of who your target might be and, and what they believe and what they're really thinking about. Exactly. People are really censoring themselves on traditional media. And then when they come off of that, it kind of goes to their head a bit and they're sharing maybe more than they should or like to. Right. So we're kind of coming up to the end of our time that I promised to take from you today, Spencer, but uh, I appreciate you coming back on the show again. Always enjoy talking with you. What is the one insight that you want listeners to remember from our conversation today? It's hard to just boil Telegram and its significance down to one thing, but I do think that the idea of human nature and the need to communicate and expand your cause can't be neglected with Telegram. Telegram seems like something that's hidden away and tucked into a corner and maybe stands on its own. But Telegram is significant because it is interconnected with everything. Telegram exists as a surface for the dark web to share links and kind of a underground for the traditional web to recruit and indoctrinate from. Telegram is the missing link between dark and surface. And it's where everything seems to be kind of happening right now. And I think that security teams should be focusing on it. And I would not be surprised if Telegram is in the news a lot more than it has been in the past in the coming months. All right, Spencer, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks again, Rob. Again, that was Spencer Oliphant, resident OSINT analyst here at LifeGraph. Thanks again for listening to another edition of the LifeGraph Security Conversation Series. If you'd like more tips on how to use open web sources to protect your company's operations, visit our website at lifegraphinc.com slash resources. That's liferapinc.com slash resources. Hope you tune in next time.